Hello and welcome to another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast. I'm your host, Antonio Caplan. I'm a trained architect, an architectural educator and founding director of award-winning Architecture for Kids CIC. In this podcast, I'm going to talk to practitioners and creatives that share the same passion as I do, to inspire and to engage children and young people to shape their built environment and the creative industries. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust and the Wells School of Architecture, Cardiff University. My guest today is Mark Southgate. Mark is Chief Executive of the charity Moby, Ministry of Building Innovation and Education. Moby exists to engage, educate and inspire young people in home design, building and manufacture and to transform home building into a clean, precision engineered and efficient industry. Mark is responsible for overseeing all Moby's activities to inspire a new generation to take up careers in and reshape the home building, built environment and construction professions and to ensure that they have the necessary skills to future-proof the industry including strategy, project management, project delivery, and the running of the charity. Mark is a chartered town planner with 35 years' experience in planning and environmental roles in local government, non-governmental organizations, and central government agencies. He is a member of the General Assembly of the Royal Town Planning Institute and the director of the Offsite Alliance. Mark, thank you for coming to talk to me today, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. It's great to be here, Antonio, and thank you for inviting me. What subject or did you enjoy most at school, and what subjects did you excel? Okay, that's a good question. Geography and history are the ones I like the most, but actually, um, in my current role, I've reflected that I actually did woodworking and design and uh, technical drawing as well, um, so I enjoyed those. I liked English. Um, probably if I excelled at anything, it was geography for my best discipline, which may explain where I've ended up in terms of my career. You've anticipated the next question, which is if it influenced your career at where now, as well as what you supported in your choices through your studies uh, to sort of to your career paths where you are. I guess I'm a, a slightly older age, so I grew up in a generation where you sort of you carried on studying, you did this, the subjects you knew best, and then sort of that led you on to where you went to do your degree. My final three subjects in my my A levels so they were were um, geography, history, and economics and public affairs, which is a, a combined discipline. Probably I've referred in uh, history, but actually I was better at geography. Went on to do that, and that's what led me into uh, into planning. So no, I just have any sort of firm thoughts about what I was going to do and just just went on to do the discipline I enjoyed best. And actually, I discovered planning in the final year of my degree. There was an option on British and overseas planning. I got into geography because I'm broadly an environmentalist from the most general perspective, both built and natural. And that was a discipline where you could carry on. But then I found planning. That was a discipline where I could carry on doing that part of my, my working career. How did you discover planning and how did your career unfold? But I discovered planning as a, as a sort of final year option, so the third year of my, my degree. And I guess that's sort of lesson one for all of us is that it's never too late to discover the thing you're really passionate about. So uh, if you don't know at the age of 16 or 18, uh, you know, I found it at 21 and some people find it even later. So um, sort of that's one of my lessons. Yeah, and then I've had a very, uh, what I describe as a squeaky career. In terms of the planning, I well, came out to university, the unemployment was, was a bit high at that time. J- jobbed on all sorts of odd jobs for a year, looking to get into planning. I started off as an enforcement officer, which is effectively a planning policeman, people who enforce the planning system. Then I worked on uh, what was then described as development control, which is dealing with planning applications in local government for six years. Uh, this is where it started going okay, a bit squiggly. Um, I then went to work for the RSPB, the Royal Society of Protection of Birds for nearly 13 years working on the planning system and how that can protect habitats and help protect bird species. Uh, so that was where I, where I worked for a while. Uh, then I moved to the Environment Agency, who have a very broad remit. I ended up doing a lot around planning and flood risk um, because there were quite bad floods in 2007, river floods, and a lot of development got flooded. So there's a question around how can we prevent that happening and are we allowing development to happen in the floodplain where it's vulnerable? And then another job, uh, I went to work for Planning Inspectorate. Uh, they are a national government body agency. Uh, so if you apply to the local authority for planning permission and it's refused, there's a right of appeal and they are the appeal body. They also um, examine local plans, which is a big part of the planning system. And lastly, I worked on the national infrastructure, 
regime for big things like um, roads and rail and power stations, be that uh, nuclear or offshore renewable and sub onshore renewable. And then finally, I ended up at where I am now, which is a way. How did Moby come about? Some of the work you're doing. Moby is the uh, Ministry of Building Innovation and Education. Uh, we're not a government body, we are a charity. Uh, we were set up by, um, or founded by George Clark, who is an architect and TV presenter that you may see on Channel 4 programmes like uh, Amazing Spaces. And the two reasons why he set up Moby, one, he's really passionate about Hove. Uh, and he describes Hove as the most important piece of architecture in, your, in our lives. And it is because actually having a, a good home and a good place to live in a good community is fundamental to well-being, to actually your progression in career etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you don't have a good home that's that's the opposite really so so home is very important but he's also really passionate about young people finding their way into the industry a lot of us find it uh, by mistake or accident uh, or by relative I, as i said i found it on like my geography course that you know, a lot of people find it by knowing people in the industry we want to make that much more visible to people and we do that with two things we um we, we have design challenges for young people from primary school age through secondary school and then further in higher education. And that's a way of either introducing young people to the built environment or helping the young people who are studying the built environment connect with industry in a better way. Um, and then we also do work with education bodies around ensuring that what people are learning in terms of the built environment and construction is what I describe as modern construction. And by modern construction, I mean it includes a big emphasis on sustainability, and that includes retrofit buildings, uh, a big emphasis on digital and how digital design and, and digital capability is increasing a part of the built environment. And then finally, a bit around process thinking, rethinking, manufacturing, what we can learn from other ways of making things, which we can then put into the built environment. One of the projects that I've been following that you've been doing is EcoFix, which I think I up now. But is there a particular project that uh, we has said that you want to talk about, or shall we talk about several of the projects? We can probably talk about several of them, but, but EcoFix is a good example. So EcoFix is, was a challenge we did with uh, Mace and uh, Grimshaw, so Grimshaw International Architects, Mace, a uh, large built environment each consulting company with a, with a focus on retrofits. So that's about how do we adapt existing buildings and bring them back into constructive use. And that's a national challenge for schools and colleges and universities. Uh, and we had some amazing entries that we had and really inventive. Uh, so what it proved, it was quite a technical subject. But it proved to me there's a lot of young people with really good ideas about how you take redundant buildings and bring them back into good use. We had a mid-terrace, a Victorian London house. Um, uh, how would you convert that into uh, a property not only which is um, energy efficient, but actually could uh, deal with um, uh, an adult with uh, mobility issues. And it was actually the the um, the, the alt of one of the, the entrance. So that was really interesting. We had a uh, older uh, hospital up in the northeast, which was now out of use. And how you bring that into a community which was co-living for older people. Really inventively, we had some Cold War aircraft shelters in Suffolk. So these are big, big sort of buildings which were used to house aircraft which would, would survive any attack from bonds, etc. And they converted those into a young person's, young professional's place where lots of young single people could live and have a community together. So you can, and, and then the finally, the, the other final winning design was one around conversion of a historic mill in Shropshire. So really different ideas, different uses, but it really shows that you can bring buildings back into use. There's a current campaign in the Architects Journal about the most sustainable building is the building that already exists. And this is about how do you take an existing building, reuse it, because about 15% of our carbon emissions are from the building off buildings. That's in the UK. So obviously, if you don't have to rebuild, that's 15% of a UK carbon you haven't used so that's, that's why we did that then other ones we've done them with cities so Design Future London we've now done with London uh, twice uh, for young people from 5 to uh, 25 plus actually so young professionals from primary school to young professionals focused on Croydon um, particularly around how do you revitalise Croydon and the Mintel Centre in Croydon um, and exciting on that challenge we had a relationship with the GLA led it to Grayson London Authority um, with Minecraft um, and there was a whole special category for 5 to 11 year olds for primary schools to enter their Minecraft designs and we saw some fabulous designs you know, there are young people out there who are digitally designing to a really sophisticated level and we need to show them they can come into our industry and continue doing that as part of their career and help us create the homes and places in the future 
terms of philosophy, what the sites given to to the participants or free to choose their site? Yeah, so we we, did, we were very open on that brief. We we said we wanted to take an existing building that you know and convert it and give it a reuse. So actually, they were all chosen by those um, uh, by those individuals, those teams, uh, and I, that's why it was amazing because you know from from those winners. Uh, who were the, the, obviously the tip of the iceberg? There are there are other entries as well. We had really contrasting different schemes for different users. It was just great to see young people grasping a building they knew and, and sort of imagining what it would look like in the future. For example, the this used mill in the Shropshire. Uh, they re-established the water wheel to provide hydro power, and they then created a big glass extension, which would um, get a lot of passive solar gain, which means it, it gathers energy from the sun, free energy from the sun. They put solar panels on. Uh, they just were really inventive about how they did it. And as I said, this converting what are now disused former aircraft shelters into a, a, some accommodation for young people was was a really inventive, clever idea. That was from the university students. Um, but but I just, we just love the breadth of what they came up with. In terms of how these programs are delivered, do you want to talk about almost step by step? How did how the kids or the end people get involved in this project? So it can vary depending on the, the challenges. Um, but first of all, we find ourselves a partner to work with. So uh, with Ecofix, it was a couple of commercial firms. Uh, with with London, it was a, the Greater London Authority and the Mayor. Um, we come up with a brief. So for London, we've had two briefs. We had one based around the the Royal Docks uh, and, re- and creating some new uh, accommodation there. And then the second one was the rail regeneration of Croydon down to town centre. And the third one will be running to the back to kick off will be around the London plan and what's the future of London and where do we find housing in London. So quite open briefs. We write the briefs. We then put those out to people. We, we create resources to go with them. So how do you design a home um, on retrofit? What is retrofit? We did some videos and some uh, asked some experts to provide some guidance around what that is. Here, what is retrofit? Well, it's taking an assisted building and make it as, uh, as useful, reusing it and introducing its energy as much as possible. Um, we then give the, the, the young people about four months normally to to come up with their designs usually working as teams so they'll brainstorm ideas actually let's take that Suffolk example that's a team of university students at, at Teesside uh, I think there were about six members of those teams they each proposed a building that they knew and they debated that's a team and chose the one that they decided to go with which was to the um, the, the, the aircraft shelters uh, and then they designed them they submit them. Then we have a, a, um, a sort of shortlisting exercise. We decide which were the best ones um, for Design Future London. We brought on some young people into that. So we had some school children who joined their judging panel to decide which we thought were the best to go to the, to the finals. Uh, we had some people who just graduated. And then we had some young professionals who were sort of in their late to, late to uh, 20s to early 30s to sort of come on board and get that young person perspective. You may not tell from my voice, I'm a little bit older. So it's around how do we get young people to come in. Uh, and it was great because the young people had really good ideas. Even you know, the school children had some great ideas about what we could do, uh, do in Croydon. So that brought in the process. Uh, so the important thing is clear brief, support to teachers. We can do some workshops to help uh, either webinars or, or come out to actual locations and do with schools or colleges. Uh, and then we sort of wait for the inspiration to come back because it is such a pleasure judging these competitions. The the quality, uh, the effort, the the capability that we get from young people never ceases. We always say never ceases to amaze us, but it's true. It's just extraordinary. Uh, and particularly for the last London Challenge, having you know, uh, five to 11-year-olds submitting their, their Minecraft designs. And some of those were incredibly sophisticated in both their design or their thinking. There was one which particularly struck me where uh, I think a nine-year-old girl had done about five green interventions in Croydon, uh, which included creating green lampposts, um, greening the tramways in Croydon, and then she showed examples elsewhere in the world where this happened. And it was a brilliant, uh, very clever way of saying, if you just did these things around Croydon, it's going to look less grey, it will bring vitality, it will bring a reason for people to visit. So it was very clever. Judging this programme, or the judging banana sort of put together. Before that, we should ask young people more about the future of the built environment, because it's it's, it's your future. If you're a young person, you know, where are the homes coming from? What sort of place am I going to live in? With that growing impacts of climate change, how are we going to make that more less vulnerable to things like uh, flash flooding, or flooding, or a capable de wind increased temperatures, as we saw a lot this summer, but the previous summer, uh, yeah, all of those things are part of what you are going to inherit from us. So actually, you should have a really strong say in, in, in what happens there. But in terms of the judging process, 
we take them in, uh, we look at them. That was normally five criteria, and this is a tip for anybody when you do when you do submissions, be that for a, a school competition or when you get into practice. Make sure you read and respond to all those criteria because we will mark each submission against those five criteria, and that might be design, uh, originality, sustainability. So how green are they? Um, uh, teamwork. We'll, we'll, we'll pick out different categories. We make those those very tier at the beginning. And then we mark people on the basis of the, the, the schemes on the basis of that. We'll do a, um, a quite large long list where we take out, we get the best. And then that's when we brought in our young judges in Design Future London and the young professionals. We then have that job as a panel to get that down to a much shorter list, which are the people who went to the, the finals and then the judges at the finals who were professional, um, the people like uh, the deputy mayor and Jules Clark and others had a role in choosing who the overall winners were. And the most important thing is, you know, if there's criteria, if there's things that a um, a competition or a story, um, a client who's up wanting you to design a building or a place says they want, then make sure you respond to all of those. And if you don't, say why, because there might be a reason why you decide not to. But if you don't do anything, that just becomes a low mark against your your scheme. This programs that you design as mode is there even alignment with a national curriculum? Bills and regulations or river stages? Yeah, obviously we try to design a challenge around a real world problem where there's people resting with it. So yeah, the, the, the Croydon was done in com- in conjunction with both the GLA and Croydon Council around. So they're, they're currently got an urban room and they're looking to involve young people about what's the future of Croydon. So it was a very real problem for them. Um, in terms of curriculum, it varies, and it can vary by country, actually. So, actually, in quite often in in England, we find you'd sort of get, and I'd say this as a geographer, I told you I was a geographer, um, you'd sort of think it fits in quite well with that curriculum at GCSE and A-level, but it doesn't to a degree because of, there's so much uh, to be learned in that that actually squeezing extra stuff in doesn't work quite so well. It's really good on design and technology. Um, in Wales, there are built environment GCSEs and A levels, so actually it's quite easy to interpret uh, to incorporate that in there. So, where we can, we link it. Where we co- where where we can't, we actually find that a lot of people step forward and want to do it anyway because it's great on the soft skills. So, working as teams, we're taking a brief and converting that into something, doing design thinking. There are a lot of things you learn on the challenge which aren't technical, but are absolutely about how you work in the world of work, how you to work if you want to do college work because if you go to university you'll be asked to work as teams on projects that sort of thing so we'd love it to be more closely related to curriculum in, in, in all honesty um but at the moment some of it has to be done outside of that but we're not short of you know people who want to take it as a challenge because they really really like it and, and want to do it in your career working with children and younger people what kind of changes have you seen and where do you think we are at at the moment? What I see is clearly a, a really strong focus by young people on sustainability and around environmental issues because those are becoming more and more apparent. They are very high on their radar. So are issues around actually, where, where am I going to live? Where is the home that I can afford? So those are quite high on the agenda. I, the, the design skills, digital design skills are just you know, so much better than they were in my day. So you know, I am of an age where I'm not sure I saw a computer at school and I only just saw when I was at university. We have young people now who have been working with computers from the age of three, four, uh, you know, and they've, they've got all of that in their head. So actually it's about how you translate that innate skill, almost like a muscle memory, into you know, putting it into designing a building. So there's that bit. And actually, I, I think, Young people's confidence in presenting is phenomenal these days. That I really like to start. You know. So I would say I see designs, and I had a designer said this, he's seen designs from 11 to 15 year olds. He says he probably may not have been doing in his second year of architecture when he studied. And I see presentations, which I don't think I'd have been doing in my 30s. You know, there is a level of confidence and of, you know, and of knowing how to get across to people that young people have because they grow up with an age of communication, which is much more visual, much more um, audio than we were, which is probably more written. In terms of the industry and, and the client, just what has been your experience? Where are we at the moment? Well, industry is paid. There's probably got three crises. And when well, I choose four, there's four crises at the least I can think of. There is a there is a housing crisis. We have a lot of things in the UK. Um, it's been in the news literally the last sort of yeah, week uh, with with various announcements from the Labour Party conference uh, up in Liverpool, I think it was uh, around yeah, the need to build more homes, etc. So, so we've got a housing crisis, not 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 my homes for people who live in this country. We've got a climate crisis, which is very obvious. 
linked to that the biodiversity crisis. So actually, um, you know, we've lost a lot of wildlife, and actually, the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world in terms of we've all that industrialization and uh, agricultural reform that we did had a real impact on our wildlife and our natural areas. So that's Kent's wife. Those are incredibly important. Uh, and then actually within industry, we've got a, a crisis of not enough people to build the homes that we need to build or build the infrastructure. Um, so industry is responding from all of those perspectives. It wants to yell people's views in terms of you know, what is the future like? What are young people thinking? Because they'll be the people who design and live in our future buildings and homes. Uh, it obviously wants those young people to come into the industry and play the part in doing that. Um, uh, so I guess that's 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 where industry is. It's very keen to engage young people. They are vital for the future. We're going to lose about twenty to twenty five percent of people in the built environment construction in the next ten years because of because of their age. Basically, they will be retiring. Um, we need that many people coming through to help us build. If it's really thousand homes per annum which was the target we had, my suspect we'll get back to. You know, that's that's a lot of people we need to bring into the system. I mean, we need people with ideas who've been thinking about this sort of stuff. So that's why industry is interested. And actually, on the retrofit challenge, in a very technical area, it's, it's an area where we're all getting our heads around how do we take these 27 million homes in the UK have got to be made more energy efficient so we can reach our, our, our goal of being net zero by 2050. How do we do that? It was really genuinely interesting to see. Where are young people on that? Are they even thinking about it? If they are, what are their thoughts? Actually, I think what we learned were not a massive amount of young people thinking about it, but there are quite a lot who are and really passionate about it, have some fantastic ideas. Now, if they want to come in the industry and help us solve some of these problems, then, then that's why industry is interested in what they have to say. And and the other thing that industry can do is um, when young people are knock on the door and say they're interested, Create that time because it's not difficult for us to go out there and, and spend an hour at a school or to invite somebody in to show them, particularly around these days with the T-levels, you know, the new learning. There's actually a lot of young people who are on those who are already interested in the built environment and need that work experience. So so making that available and, and telling them about what we do because that can only will either inspire them or it might confirm that that's actually not what they want to do. But either way, that's important. But hopefully it inspires them and shows them what the industry is all about. I tend to find that most people in the industry really love what they do, and I don't mind talking about it. So I think the thing is having the confidence that you can talk about the built environment in general and then what you do, uh, and that that will very often inspire a young person and help them understand a bit better what they could be doing, because it's really around showing them options and letting them do the narrowing of the options. So I think your job, our job, is to say, well, here's the built environment of the round, here's all the things you could be doing, and then they go off and find out what it is they actually want to do. You already talked to a bit about what is the impact on children and young people by involving them in programs such as the ones that Moby does, the built environment as well. There's a strange thing around. The built environment is everywhere, so we see it every day. And around 9% of the UK population work uh, in a job which is related to the built environment, being that the building of the buildings or running and maintenance of those buildings or even at the end, the demolition or dismantling of those buildings. Yet it's not very visible to people. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, and when it is visible, there, there tend to be two things that people know. There's architecture, which is quite often very aspirational and something that people really want to get into. And then there's construction, which is quite often seen in the other direction. It's in terms of uh, that's generating a B4. Young adults who are probably not very academic because they're much more hands-on workers, think in a 3D way, and you know, why don't you go and work in construction? There's a whole range of jobs between between those. So, so part of this is around showing those to young people, explaining they're there. And actually, not just young people. So this is you know, two teachers, two careers advisors, two parents, that there's this massive industry, which is amazing. Most of the people who are in the industry, like me, love what we do. You can probably tell that from my son, you know, my, my tone of voice. I love what I do. It's a brilliant industry to get into. Yeah, we're going to make an impact in terms of trying to address climate change. We're creating homes for people. We're creating communities. We're revitalizing areas. That is an incredibly positive thing to be doing. But yet, somehow, people don't find those jobs. So that's one of the reasons we do it. And then, um, and then, what we find is, yeah, you know, we'll get to a certain group of people. What I've found is we get to two broad groups of people. There are people who are very interested in it, but it's perhaps a little bit uncool, and their love of the built environment, like mine when I had it, wasn't shared by everybody. Um, but they better find there's links of other people out there who think the same way. So one, it gives them the confidence to say, oh. It's not just me. And actually, oh my God, there's all these people working in, in the world of, of the built environment who are doing jobs like this. I could be that. So that's one. The second one is the people who just don't know it's there and go, oh, that's interesting. Awesome. 
Well, Lake Elk could do that. Well, so what? You know, what does an accountant do in a construction firm, or what does an architect do, or what's a quantity surveyor do? Um, so they get to understand what it's all about. So that's that's bre- broadly what we're about. And then we've got a lovely story of. So before I joined, maybe the first challenge we ran was in 2018. Uh, was won by a um, group of girls from a uh, Nottingham Girls Academy in Nottingham. Uh, they were 11 to 14 year olds. I think they're mainly 14. Um, they beat university teams. Their their idea of a hexo homes hexagonal student accommodation was to, to judge the overall winning design in that um, that group. I should explain. We run these by age groups, so we'll run the primaries, the secondaries, the further and higher education. But then, so they can each be a winner of their age group. But then we'll pitch them in at the end to say who's the overall winner. So one of the girls on that 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 team is now studying interior architecture at Teesside University. She came from a family with no history working in construction, the built environment. She came from a school which has really not sent people on those sort of disciplines. So it, for her, has been a way to say, oh, that's enough of working. And now she's going off and following that. So it's really opening up that opportunity to say it's there. There's lengths of people working in that industry who would love you to join them. And actually, here's some of the routes you can take. At school, could more be done about and open pupils and students' eyes to these careers? It is a great industry to work in. If you want to make a real difference, it's a fantastic industry to work in with massive opportunities, uh, lots of things, the different things you can do within that industry. There aren't that many industries where you can say, I help build that, I help create that community, I make, help design that house or that home. Yeah, it's a really tangible thing as you can see the physical product of what you've been involved in. So that's that's one of its great attractions. In terms of sort of curriculum, well, we've actually done some work with um, Twinkle, who are a, a big resource provider for primary schools. And we created uh, with their Scotland um, team a resource called Building Our Future, which is aimed at primary schools from frog reception up to the final year of primary school, all about the built environment and the home and sustainable development. It was done around about the um, COP26 summit, which is the Climate Change Summit, which was held in Glasgow, if you remember. Um, and it was, and it's all about, you know, um, green buildings, green roofs, water resources, energy, insulation, explaining those concepts in simple classroom exercises. So people start asking that question because it's about asking questions, really. Okay. Well, who did build my home and how do they work? And are they say energy efficient? And is my school energy efficient? And, and how could we make it more energy efficient? And, and do we? Yeah, do we have an area for bot wildlife and do we save water? All those things that you can just carry on through life not thinking about, or you start once you start thinking about them, you can't stop thinking about them. So yes, so we can do that primary school education, open people's eyes, get them to think about it. I'd love to see more um at secondary level. I think what Wales is doing around built environments is really interesting. Um and hopefully we might get some of that in, in England in due course. Um Geography clearly is a discipline where it's relevant, so it's design and technology, so I'd like to see them think about more about the built environment. I mean, there's quite a lot of it in there. There's climate change as well, so it's creating those links. It's, it's, it's maybe being more direct around these are the concepts that you learn, but have you ever, did you realise you could go on and do that as a career? There's a whole range of jobs which are basically addressing those problems and trying to solve those problems. Enough can we talk to the parents about careers in children, as well as careers advisors, teachers. Well, I've, I've got two older kids now, but they, they were younger. And, I, and as with every child, it's finding the thing they're passionate about. Um, so, you yeah, know, we, 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 we will expose this to a lot of young kids. And for some, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. It's not what they're interested in, but some it is. So if A, don't steal away from doing it, if they show an interest, let them pursue that interest because, you know, as we hopefully anybody who's in a job which they love doing knows it doesn't feel like a job it feels like a vacation it feels like you know if i'm getting paid to do something i love doing so don't sort of stop that enthusiasm if anyone find a way to channel it so our design challenges are one way but there's loads of other ways you can do it you know, they're probably watching built environment programs or looking at buildings etc encourage that interest I've got an equal natural environment interest. So if they're interested in natural environment, you know, you know, understanding, you know, about species or why that land falls there. It's just sort of it's it's asking those questions of why rich young kids always do. So if they're asking those questions, keep that going. And then see if you can connect in uh, to people who are working in the local area who who are doing those sort of jobs, maybe to connect or or, or talk to people like us. Or there are others in the built environment who do these sort of things. But the number one, talk about it, show it to them. Um I often say that people who are interested in the built environment walk around towns bumping into people because they're always looking above shop level. If you look at shops and shop fronts, that many of them, not all of them, that many have been converted and they're now quite modern. If you look above, there's another layer of buildings at the first and second and third floors, 
which show a much older history, and you can go around and see things. Well, how old's that? I mean, you know, who built that? Oh, it's a, there's a, pla- a plaque on that says that was built in 1780. I wonder who built that. It's around sort of, you know, opening your eyes, really. I once had an art teacher, and I'm not a great artist, but he said, look, you know, and then he said, really, look. And that's one thing I learned from him, you know, just look at something and really think about it. And, and so encourage that, encourage their passions. Uh, and then if they have got a genuine passion, see if you can connect, see if the school's got information about um, jobs in that area. Um, and if not, try and connect with local people who might do, because there will be architects or local government, local council, and all sorts of people who are working in the area who might be able to provide some help. I am a planner by profession, but I increasingly talk about being a, a built environmentalist in that I'm interested in the whole of the built environment and how it works and showing people that you know, actually have you ever thought about what it takes to Develop, build, design, run, uh, uh, um, deconstruct uh, a, a house, uh, a city, uh, you know, a, a wider area. So actually, what does it take to run a city? Because actually, that's what we're in, or a town, or a village. Um, so there's a bit around that. Um, probably in terms of sort of questions, no, I, I think you know, the, the education side, it's it's around this. We need to be making sure that the, the young people coming into the industry are coming with the right skills and the skills to challenge it. So... My other criticism of the industry would be we're not as joined up as we could be and we're also not as uh, inventive as we could be. So so one of the reasons we want young people to join is because we want them to come in and ask the, the, the most important question in the world, why? Why do you do that? Why are you building a building which doesn't have zero carbon emissions? Because we can do it. We know how to do it. And, and it's by young people coming in and challenging us to do better that we will get better. So so that's probably what we'd love to want people to see. But, Young people coming in and ask them really difficult questions about why do you do it that way? You know, why haven't you done this other way? So yeah, that would be my sort of my plea. And actually, the thing that you can do most as a young person never never stop asking that question why because it quite off because the answer will often be because that's how we've always done it. And then you ask again, well, why have you always done it that way? And and because sometimes you get stunned silence because they haven't been asked that question and they don't know the answer, and that's. Sometimes because, well, somebody in the 1930s invented that way of doing things and nobody's ever thought of changing it. So, yeah, come in, shake us up a bit, challenge us, uh, and and date Sebastian Woolley. My life's a pleasure. Thank you very much to my guests today, to all the listeners, and please subscribe to Architecture for Kids podcast and leave your rating and a review. Recommend us to your friends and family. And to find out more about it, visit our websites antoniocaplan-portfolio.co.uk, buildingcenter.co.uk, thorntoneducationtrust.org, cardiff.ac.uk, and follow us on Instagram, arch for kids cic Twitter, Ant Kaplan, LinkedIn, Ant Kaplan, C-A-P-E-L-A-O, and please join me again next week for another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust and the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University.